welcome. We're glad that you joined us. Our friends tonight that are with us are Rabbi Harold Kushner, who has written the book, uh, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And uh, Harold, we're glad that you're with us. And Dr. Norman Geisler from Dallas Theological Seminary. We're talking about this serious question because all of us suffer. All of us encounter evil. And so it starts us thinking about what kind of a God is in the universe, what kind of a God is out there, if he is there. And uh, both men agree that he's there. But uh, Rabbi Kushner believes that he's all-loving but limited in his power, where Dr. Geisler is holding that he is all-loving and all-powerful, and we can still hold to that even in a world that does have evil in it. Uh, gentlemen, this week we're going to start with some questions from our audience. And our first question is right here. Well, my uh, question goes oh. to Mr. Kushner. In the title of your book, uh, you use the terminology when bad things happen to good people and then you went on in your discussion to call those good people really innocent people you feel that bad things happen to innocent people my question is who indeed is innocent uh, before God uh, do you consider yourself a good person and thereby innocent uh, before God from having any bad thing happen in a brief answer yes that is I I'm constantly seeing people who are subjected to fates they don't deserve. I'm not concerned about their innocence. I'm not concerned about their freedom from the taint of sin. I'm concerned about a sense of proportionality and justice. I think a child who is born handicapped or retarded is an innocent person, whatever your theology or mine about inherited original sin may be. I think a person who tries to be a good husband, good father, good neighbor, and is struck down by a drunk driver is a good person in the sense that he didn't deserve all these things happening to him. That's what I had in mind when I titled my book as I did. Uh, can I pick up on that sure. in terms of, uh, I think that uh, Dr. Geisler, correct me if I'm wrong, that Christianity would hold that, yes, that innocent people are innocent when they do suffer. For example, Jesus Christ himself suffered. Therefore, we would not say he was guilty. He deserved it. All right? So, and I think that that is also the message of the book of Job, going back to that is that, uh, yes, that uh, God wants us to love him for himself, not for what we get out of him. And that includes the fact that there are times when we don't understand all of his ways. Uh, Dr. Geisler, maybe you'd like to add something not only to that, but also this fact of where this question was coming from concerning are all people innocent? Well, let's just take it on an Old Testament basis. I think uh, Psalm 51 says, I was born in sin, sin did my mother conceive me. Prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17 said that man, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, Moses said in Genesis 6, 5 that every thought of the imagination of the heart was only evil continually. I think you can challenge the thesis even from the Old Testament that man is basically innocent and basically good. I think that since the fall, man is evil and that uh, in a sense we deserve far worse than we get. Now I can empathize with the tragedies that happen in life but I think in the light of a just God, in the light of uh, rebellious human beings, in the light of the Old Testament verses on the depravity of man, we have to be very careful in saying that man is good and therefore didn't deserve anything. Man is basically evil and deserves more uh, than he gets. And uh, we can be thankful to a gracious God that he doesn't give us more uh, than we actually get. Shakespeare says something like that in Hamlet. If everyone got his just desserts, who would escape a whipping? But Norm, I think you should have quit when you were ahead. I think that the, this kind of uh, view of man, first, I don't believe is scripturally valid, at least in terms of the Hebrew Bible. And even if it is, I think misrepresents the kind of religion which you and I have been sharing for all the weeks we've been talking. It seems to me that if the Hebrew scripture were to make a major statement about the nature of man, it would not tuck it into a single verse in the psalm. Of all the books of the Bible, the Psalms, more than any, much as I love them, represent human beings talking to God rather than God talking to Israel or to the human race. It seems to me that what you get from the Hebrew Scriptures is not a story of the depravity of man, but of the weakness of man with a great deal of sympathy along with the impatience. Beyond that, anyone who has served as a pastor in a congregation will have seen perhaps not theologically innocent, perfect people, but certainly good and well-meaning people who don't deserve what they have been getting. 
one has to simply walk down the corridor of a hospital and see that there is undeserved suffering disproportionate to what has gone on. And it seems to me it is, even, even if one were to try and demonstrate that it's theologically acceptable, it seems to me morally unacceptable to answer the terminally ill cancer patient who groans, why am I suffering, by saying, because your mother conceived you in sin. Well, first of all, I don't think we can quite that smoothly uh, push away all those verses of Scripture. I quoted from the Psalms. Mm -hmm. I quoted from the Prophets. I quoted from the Torah. I quoted from throughout the Old Testament. You can also add to it the book of Ecclesiastes. There's not a just man upon the earth that does good and sins not. I think that what we have is a picture throughout the entire Old Testament of a God who looks down on a creation that he made perfect, that he gave freedom to, that they rebelled, and as a consequence, sin and death and judgment came in. And yet in his mercy, he saves us from everything we do deserve. Someone said grace is giving us what we don't deserve, and mercy is saving us from what we did deserve. And surely, in a basic sense of the Old Testament Scripture, man is sinful, he deserves the judgment of God, but God is gracious and overflowed in his love and saved us from the judgment uh, we deserve. So rather than calling man good, I would rather follow the Hebrew Scriptures and uh, recognize that man is evil. I just don't find that in Hebrew Scriptures not nearly as strongly and as unequivocally as you. What would you do with all those verses I just quoted? All those verses? What? I one found verse them in out of 150 no, no, Psalms? No, no, I found all those verses in the Hebrew Scripture. Genesis 6-5, right. uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, Psalm 51, uh, Jeremiah 17. No, I could go on four and on. Lines, four lines out of 22 books? Well, give me, That is a theological doctrine? Give me one verse that says, just one, that says that man is intrinsically uh, good and not fallen. Well, it never says he's fallen. It says he's rebellious. It says he's always doing wrong things. But you see, for the Jewish concept of man, sin is an event, not a condition. One sins, but one does not become a sinner thereby. One is simply an imperfect man. But where does it say that 100 is the minimum passing grade? Yeah, we all do wrong things. But there is, I think, an emphasis in Hebrew Scripture, which is different in Christianity, I will certainly acknowledge. An emphasis that says, if you put your mind to it, you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. I didn't quote Christian scripture. I quoted mm -hmm. Jewish scripture. And I'm asking you to give me one verse from Jewish scripture that says that man is intrinsically good and not sinful and not fallen. I think Genesis 1 about let us make man in our image. That was before he fell. But it's still the nature of man. I know, but I'm talking about after but Adam But you see, I don't, I don't see Genesis 3 as a fall. We were through this a couple of weeks ago. I think the Psalms, for example, are suffused with a sense of human beings who are basically good, basically God-fearing, feel that they have reason to be in God's good graces, and are always saying, how long, O Lord, will you torment us like this? But why, is the, why are the Psalmists constantly crying out because of their enemies, those that hate them, those that are judging them, asking for vindication? If man is so intrinsically good, why are the Psalms filled with all these prayers for deliverance and uh, impre imprecations and uh, uh, enemies. Uh, I don't see that throughout because the Psalms. Because it's the Psalmists who are good and who are being picked on by unscrupulous enemies. But if they deserve it, why are they crying out to God? The question is not whether they deserve it. The question is whether man is evil as reflected in the Psalms. And I see the Psalmist confessing his own sin. In fact, in Psalm 19, uh, David uh, cried out and said, uh, who can understand his errors? God, you said in your book that God has flaws, that God is imperfect. David prayed uh, that he would be cleansed of his errors, not that he would recognize errors in God when he said, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Of course. One of the purposes of religion is to make human beings better. But I think you are misinterpreting Hebrew Scripture when you see them as picturing man as evil. They picture man as imperfect. Imperfect is not necessarily the same as evil. I'd be glad to be corrected from Hebrew Scriptures, but I've yet to hear a verse uh, that says that man is intrinsically good after Genesis 3 when he f uh, took the forbidden fruit and disobeyed God. All right, we're going to break right there. We're going to pick this up. Uh, we'll take a break. We'll come right back. I don't think that Hebrew Scripture makes major theological pronouncements a word here and a word here. Uh, it is not systematically theological at all. It tells a story. It tells a story of an Israelite people 
who are very often backsliding and stubborn, but still worthy of being objects of God's affection, who are struggling upwards, who are trying to create a more decent society than the pagan worlds around them, who have a higher standard of justice and sensitivity than anything the world had previously seen. It does not say they are perfect. They don't have to be perfect. But let me They're ask you human. this. You say the Hebrew scriptures do not make major pronouncement concerning the condition of man as being sinful. Does it make a major pronouncement concerning man as being intrinsically good? No, because it's not a theological book. It's a book about life. Well, I would say that uh, there's no difference between those two. A theological book can be a book about life. Why do you have to bifurcate the two? Because it is simply not given to make a theological pronouncement. Theology is not a Jewish metier. Well, Theolo theology forget comes, about the yeah. word theology. Does it tell us truth about life as God gives it, whatever you want to call it? Yes, I believe it does, but okay. I believe that that truth arises from the comprehensive narrative picture in its context and not from isolated proof texts. But is that comprehensive narrative picture, such as I quoted a whole comprehensive right. picture of those verses, no, you didn't. that man you is in rebellion you against verses. God? Well, they're isolated verses, but they're not out of context, and they're throughout the entire Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a series of verses uh, or truths throughout the Old Testament that says that man is intrinsically not in rebellion against God? No, all I can give you is a volume of 22 books in Hebrew which paint a picture of a people who are sometimes weak and rebellious and sometimes faithful and inspiring. But isn't that same picture from that volume of the 22 or 24 books, yeah. depending on how you uh, count them, uh, a picture of a rebellious people who is a consequence of uh, Adam's uh, sin are with a propensity and a continual practice of sin and are constantly in rebellion against God and need atonement? Not as I read it. Well, what was the whole atonement for? What atonement? The, the day of atonement, the uh, uh, sacrifice. For imperfection, for the fact that we're not perfect, not but, that we're terrible sinners, but Leviticus, not that we're fallen. But uh, Leviticus uh, clearly says that this was for the sins of the people. Right, the imperfections, the fact that they haven't been perfect. But that's uh, Not sin. for the sinfulness of the people, but for the individual deeds of sin. Their sins follow from the fact that they can sin, don't of they? Of course, yeah, that they're not perfect. And the atonement was given for these sins. Now, how do you say they're a, a good people when constantly they had to offer sacrifice for their continual sins? Because they're good people, but not perfect. If they weren't good people, why would they be trying to atone? Why wouldn't they simply wallow in their sinfulness the way the Canaanites did? The fact that they are willing to follow God's direction doesn't mean that they didn't sin. I mean, the fact that I'm willing to confess my sin is one thing, but the fact that I continually sin is another thing, and I'm talking about the latter. Doesn't the Old Testament paint a picture of a people who are continually sinning, continually rebelling, continually worshiping idols, continually uh, putting something else first over than the, the one and true God? Sure, in the same way that the newspaper is full of wars and murders and automobile accidents, this is not where life is lived. In the same way that the law codes deal with crimes and not with people being faithful and law-abiding, because it is the nature of law codes to talk about the extraordinary, and it is the nature of newspapers to report the extraordinary. And the parts of Scripture which are law codes talk about misdeeds, and the parts of Scripture which are, for example, the Book of Judges, talk about misdeeds because normal life is dull. I mean, you have a verse in the Book of Judges, for example, and the land was quiet for 40 years. That's 40 years without worshiping idols. And then after the 40 years, they start to backslide. And because war and oppression and God sending a redeemer is much more interesting copy than the land being peaceful for 40 years, it gets a disproportionate amount of ink in the Bible. Just as crimes and wars get a disproportionate amount of coverage in the newspaper. You will never see a newspaper article saying, plane land safely at local airport. You will only see an article that says plane crashes. Not because planes crash all the time, not because airplanes are unsafe, but because when a plane crashes, it is dramatic news. Well, you make interesting uh, comment there, but I don't think that represents the Old Testament because one thing that distinguishes the Old Testament from a normal uh, newspaper account is the Old Testament says the good along with the bad. It'll tell the great things about people as well as the bad things, but in spite of the fact that it gives a balanced picture, it still presents man as in continual rebellion against God, manifest in different ways internally and externally, but perpetually and by inclination, and uh, you seem to admit this and yet want to say that man is somehow intrinsically good. I don't understand how you can have both. Point number one, 
you're not simply arguing with me, you are arguing with 3,000 years of Jewish understanding of the Bible, which says that human beings are not bad because they're not perfect. That Abraham and David and all these wonderful patriarchs were not perfect, but they were still darn good people. Secondly, and this gets back to the question which started this whole uh, involvement, when people are hurt in life, my pastoral experience is that frequently they suffer out of all possible proportion to their sinfulness. That they are not perfect is no justification for what people have to go through, let alone the question of proportionality that the, you know, if, if imperfect people are going to be struck down, why aren't the most imperfect struck down most dramatically? I think it's that which I had in mind when I said that innocent people suffer. It's not a juridical concept of innocence. It's a sense of disproportionality. Well, I understand the horizontal thing that you have in mind, but mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure you understand the vertical thing I have in mind. I do understand that. I'm, I'm just talking not persuaded about, by it. I'm talking about the Old Testament presenting mm -hmm. a picture of man in continual vertical rebellion mm -hmm. against God, right. for which he is accountable before God, mm -hmm. and for which sacrifices are necessary to atone mm -hmm. for sin. Do you see that picture in the Old Testament? Of course I see it. But that does not brand man as hopelessly sinful. Well, I would think it's hopelessly sinful if he can't do anything for himself and God has to provide a lamb as a sacrifice that man is hopeless in himself unless God provides graciously for his salvation. Right. That is the Christian overlay on Hebrew scriptures. I recognize it. Well, I don't think it's the Christian overlay. I, I wasn't referring to anything Christian. I'm referring simply to the Old Testament scriptures himself. Did God not provide sacrificial lambs for the sins of the people? Did he not provide a day of atonement for the whole nation? Were, was there not a continual sacrificial system for their continual sins? Regardless of whether Christ fulfilled this, which yeah. is a Christian concept, mm -hmm. don't you see even that in the Old Testament? That God provided the lambs only in the sense that he created all living creatures. The people brought the lambs. The but people were they brought not the lambs to provided express. for sin? Sometimes for sin and sometimes for joy and sometimes for the birth of a child and sometimes for a good harvest. The lamb was sometimes provided for joy? Sure. Uh, there were thank offerings, but mm -hmm. it was not the lamb that was a thank offering. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, for example, in a space of seven days, you would offer 70 rams, right? They were not atonement. They were celebration. They were gratitude. Well, but uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was a feast of thanksgiving, but are you saying that the sacrifices that were offered there were not for sin? That's precisely what I'm saying. Where does it say that in the Scripture? Try the book of Numbers, well, chapter 28. Well, give me the, the concept or the verse or what is it? It says, say? you shall rejoice on this holiday and you shall bring these, the, what's known as the Korban Todah, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And it's 14 lambs one day, and 13 lambs the next day, and 12 lambs the next. This is not atonement for sin. This is sheer expression of joy. The way, for example, when a person marries off a daughter, he will invite his friends and relatives to a big dinner, and many more than 14 lambs will be slaughtered to fill their place. And are you saying that's the same thing that the, the lamb and the Passover was uh, a thanksgiving instead of atonement? From the lamb's point of view, it's the same thing. No, from I'm not the, talking uh, about that. I'm talking about from God's <laughs> point of view and man's point of view. Did no, God... from man's point of view, it's totally different. From man's point of view, an offering and celebration and gratitude is psychologically 180 degrees different. The lamb from wasn't an given to atone for sin? The Paschal lamb was. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Sure. So the fact that uh, there were offerings on other occasions that mm -hmm. were thank offerings does not negate the fact that there were continual offerings for continual sins. Right. And well, there were, you know, or repeated But if you sins. say that, then I can't understand how you can say that man is not continually a sinner and that he's essentially good. Because a person who is imperfect is not continually a sinner. He's just less than perfect. Yeah, but less than perfect is sinful, is it not? No. I am less judgmental than you, and I believe God is. But if God's standard uh, is X and I do less than X, am mm -hmm. I not falling short of God's standard? Absolutely. All and we have to do then is define what X is. But if I fall short of God's standard, then I've sinned, have I not? Sure, I just don't know what God's standards are. Well, hasn't he revealed them in the Old Testament? Isn't, for yes. example, Exodus 20 God's standard? Yes, but I'm not totally sure that 95% is a failing grade. Yes, but don't 100% of the people at one time or another mm -hmm. fall short of the standard of God revealed in Exodus 20 called the Ten Commandments? That is, no. is there anyone who ever lived who perfectly kept all the Ten Commandments. Hey, watch it now. The Ten Commandments are a giveaway. The Ten Commandments are simply a way of staying out of jail. Yeah, there are tens of millions of people who never murder and never commit adultery and never steal. And never and have any parents. false gods and never sure. uh, lie. There are tens of millions of people who have never committed, broken any one of the Ten Commandments. I believe that. I would like to meet one. 
I hope you will. <laughs> I, I hope I do too. What? People... Because the, the uh, psalmist uh, said clearly in Psalm 14 that they've all uh, sinned. In Isaiah chapter 53, we've all gone astray. And that's why the right, lamb me, had to be sacrificed. Let me break right in here. And uh, Dr. Geisel, let me ask you where you're going with this in 30 seconds here. Well, I just uh, simply trying to point out that in uh, Psalm 14 and in Isaiah 53, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own ways. And that's why the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And uh, to say that it's not true in the Old Testament that people didn't continually sin seems to me to negate what the prophet said. And how said. does this relate to our topic of the problem of evil or suffering? Because the basic thesis of Rabbi Kushner's book is that uh, bad things happen to good people. And I think that people are not intrinsically good. They're intrinsically evil and sinful and need sacrifices. And therefore, the whole thesis of the book collapses if you deny the fact that man's intrinsically good. And at the same time, I don't think that you're saying that's the only reason that there is suffering and evil. By no means. But it seems to me that God is gracious in not giving us more uh, judgment that he's merciful in delivering us from more consequences. For right. no, we're, we're, sorry. I think we're gonna have to, we're have to cut to right here, guys. We'll, we'll, we'll pick it up. We'll pick it up here in the next program, but uh, we're out of time. Just join us next week. We'll be with you.